With all writing and maybe even with all art projects, there's a gap between the vision you had for the work and the thing that you actually made. And you're coming up against uh, the limits of your own skills as well as your circumstances in terms of the time and space to write. And so I think of the ideal editor as someone who grasps the original idea and helps you close that gap just a little bit. Um, so they improve the piece, but they also develop um, my own capacities for the next project. I'm a writer as well, and I know that writers don't always make good editors or vice versa, but it does give me empathy. Um, it gives me a sense of everything that the writer has put into the piece, all of the labor and um, all of the soul. And so I think that helps me know how important staying true to that voice is. It's a privilege to be edited. Um, to have someone closely read your work and apply themselves to its improvement. And it's usually for me been a really wonderful collaboration and a chance to evolve as a writer. Um, and even the feedback that you don't end up taking is, is your teacher since it helps, it helps you really distill what matters to you and your voice. After reading a piece, I'll ask myself uh, what I think the writer's trying to do or say. I'll make notes of places where I'm not sure if that intention is coming through. Um, I'll write down any questions I might have had that came up as I was reading. I'll also try to think whether there's anything I need to know to edit the piece. The piece that we're going to discuss is called Mother Tongue and it's a lyric essay. I wrote it in an exploration of um, the role that Dutch, my first language, plays within my writing and my life in English. It centers around uh, an anecdote of, of a field trip that I took as a grade one student in the Netherlands and explores questions of the sounds of vowels and the role they play in accent and dialect and class, as well as the making of bricks. This field trip was to the factory itself. The building that had manufactured bricks was also made of bricks. One tall round chimney, a row of arched ovens with crumbling walls, and a dandelion roof. The guide had worked at the factory. The river clay, he explained, had been dug from where the quarry now was, then purified and shaped and baked. He told us the quality of bricks can be confirmed by listening for their lucid musical pitch when banged together. I love Sadika's attention to language um, and the scene that she's building here. What we didn't see in, in her reading is that um, just the paragraph before, she says, my class visited a brick factory. Um, so the, the sentence, the field trip was to the factory itself, was a repetition and um, sometimes repetition is intentional, and so I didn't think that sentence was necessary here, but I queried Sadiqa to see if she felt the same way. Liz's specific comment on that line was perhaps delete, <laughs> as you've said above, that the class visited the factory, and she's absolutely right there. That line was, um, was redundant, and it made me think of uh, what James Baldwin says about writing, that paraphrasing but you want to write a sentence as clean as a bone and that's true for the, the larger paragraph structure as well so this paragraph was cleaner without that line. The last item in the list is a dandelion roof and she pointed out that that no longer emphasizes what what the first part of the sentence is saying that the structure is made of bricks now it sounds like that part is made of dandelions and that's the sort of very specific clarity that I really appreciate about her editing. It's just that she'll give it that sort of attention and, and catch errors on that level, which is wonderful. And so I changed that line to a roof overgrown with dandelions, which both preserves that image of those flowers, 
but also maintains the idea that um, I'm listing the, the brick components. I want to be careful not to make a writer translate to know sort of the limits of what I can know for the piece and and not try to be like, oh, well, I don't get this reference, so it should be cut, or I don't know what this means, so we need to exp explain it and spell it out to the reader or, or put a parenthetical translation in there. There's an extent to which you can do that, but you just want to be careful about overstepping and about um, who are we trying to make the piece accessible for it. The building that had manufactured bricks was also made of bricks. One tall round chimney, a row of arched ovens with crumbling walls, and a roof overgrown with dandelions. Our guide had worked at the factory. The river clay, he explained, had been dug from where the quarry now was then purified and shaped and baked. He told us the quality of bricks can be confirmed by listening for their lucid musical pitch when banged together. It's one of the funniest editing notes I've ever gotten. And I cite a little bit of a Dutch like children's folk song in the piece, just a, a couple of lines. And then, yeah, getting a note back and being like, I can't find this exact wording. Oh yes, like, yeah. This is a song that my mom sang to me and I have to look it up now. <laughs> but like, I did find it. You know you're in good hands when people are paying that level of attention, right? In those instances, I'm very careful. I mean, what I can find on Google isn't necessarily Truth. So it's I, the, in yeah. those ones when I'm, you know, when I can't confirm the lyrics of a song in a different language, that yeah. I want to always be careful that while I'm checking things to the best of my ability, I know who has the knowledge in that exchange. I just think, you know, it was such a, a privilege to to publish that piece. It's it was really beautiful, and as I said, it you know it grabbed me. Um, from the first time I read it and um, I think you're a beautiful writer and I'm just grateful that you were a part of Frick. <laughs> Thank you.